Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Penyan Action Coalition live community reads discussion. Uh, hope you're having a happy Monday, a good start to the new week under the uh, temporary new world situation. Uh, a new week is an opportunity for new opportunities. Um, I got myself back into a little bit of a routine more than I had last week, so I'm feeling good, ready to face this week and all of the challenges and uh, opportunities it may bring. So hope you're here with us. As always, if you tune in late, these videos will be available um, on, oops, I'm buzzing. Uh, these videos will be available on the library's YouTube page as well as here on Facebook. Um, and we will get ready to go here. So um, today we're actually finishing off uh, part two of the book, our discussion of the themes around part two uh, with the topic of fear. Um, we were kind of figuring out what we wanted to do for the, the next few weeks um, to finish off the book. Um, and I think one of the email uh, um, communications uh, ended up making it seem like we we're jumping into part three today. We'll be getting into part three on Wednesday. Uh, Got to finish off part two today. Um, and uh, uh, our our wonderful uh, compatriot, Claudia, uh, put together a great collection of themes to carry us through part three of the book. And then we'll be doing some things for um, the sort of denouement parts of the, of the work. Um, so let's get into it. Um, Claudia has given us this to say about the subject of fear. Part two ends with a discussion of fear. Quoting poet and essayist Cristina Rivera Garza, Cantu writes, fear isolates. Fear teaches us to distrust. He concludes that this fear makes us individually and as a society crazy, isolated, filled with distrust for our fellow human beings the people who share our neighborhoods, our cities, our country, our borders, our intractably and intimately interwoven global communities, the people with whom we share our very lives. That's on page 158. And Claudia asks for thoughts and comments. Um, it's amazing how interwoven all of the themes we have read into this book over the past couple of weeks um, really tie back together from that first talk uh, first day we started talking about the imagery of the wolf through today um, and this I think fear is really the linchpin um, I know that in an earlier discussion um, there had been some discussion about uh, you know this culture we live in where we teach our children to um, to take extra care, you know, in the, uh, you know, don't say hello to strangers on the street, stranger danger. Um, and how there's good reason for that on one hand, but on the other hand, does that contribute to this, um, this moment in our history where we are uniquely, it seems, well, maybe not uniquely, but it seems like we are very strongly unwelcoming to the other. And let's see what our compatriots in the Penny and Action Coalition think about this. So we had some notes from Cindy with contributions from her husband, Jim. Um, Cindy says, I looked at the passages surrounding the expose about poet and essayist Christina Rivera Garza's thinking. Fear can be paralyzing. Does it paralyze Cantu? What evidence of paralysis is there? to not tell his fellow border patrollers that he needs to leave, to not reveal his feelings to them. He doesn't want to reveal to his fellow workers how fearful he is, and it comes out in his dreams. Dreams being another one of those um, themes we've discussed over the past week. Cindy goes on to say, I found the thinking of Garza about fear hard to understand. Quote, 
pain not only destroys, but produces reality, end quote. Cindy asks that someone help us figure out what she is saying. Oh, Peggy can hear us. Hi, Peggy. Um, and yeah, reading that, uh, that line, pain not only destroys, but produces reality. That's certainly one of those statements that is not immediately and self-evidently understandable. Cindy goes on to say, uh, she and her husband, Jim, read through this Garza section this morning, reading it out loud in the morning rather than at midnight, hovering over the computer with one light on to not disturb the pup. They have a, a new dog, very, uh, very proud of pup parents. Um, they fared more worthwhile, so it worked out better for them reading together in the morning. Uh, Jim commented that we are experiencing fear during this pandemic, fear and pain. Uh, Cindy quotes page 158, the first full paragraph. Pain has the power to destroy and to produce its own reality, a reality of fear, a reality that makes us individually and as a society crazy, isolated, filled with distrust for our fellow human beings, that section that uh, Claudia quoted. Cindy says that Jim's first comment after reading that passage was, quote unquote, it's complicated. Yes, indeed. Perhaps Cantu includes reference to these essays from professionals and experts and distinguished thinkers throughout the book because he needs help in figuring this all out. He cannot do it by himself. And I think none of us can. Um, but having read through that paragraph um, about pain destroying and producing reality, um, I think, you know, it's, it's still somewhat hard to grasp, but I think you can see from the whole quote um, that it, the reality of fear, um, isolated, distrusting, that's the reality that it's creating. Unfortunately, that's the reality we're all living in to one extent or another today. Uh, so thank you for those thoughts, Cindy and Jim. Uh, Scarlett, our friend Scarlett, wrote, uh, in so many conversations I've had over the last few years, fear has been a central topic. How fear is controlling, how fear of the other leads to prejudice, how fear can bring about violence, how fear can paralyze. And as Garza writes, fear is linked with pain, teaches us to distrust, makes us crazy. That's the third time now that specific a uh, set of symptoms has been referenced by our distinguished planning committee. Uh, it seems to me that fear is at the root of so much that is wrong with society today, and it grows and grows and grows. Rather than try to calm our fears and to offer ways to counteract it, our leaders at all levels build on it to attain power and control. While it is good to acknowledge some fear of those things that are truly dangerous, for example, too much speed on the road, so burning building. It is important to sort out what is truly something to be afraid of from that which is unknown to us and once known might actually enrich our lives. That's a really important point. Um, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but I think there is a highly visible example of that idea um, prevalent in our society all around us right now um, and that's in, uh, in perhaps society's response to the LGBTQ community. Um, for how many centuries was the LGBTQ community seen as a frightening other that needed to be, um, kept at arm's length when not actively suppressed? Um, and of course, you know, we haven't solved that problem. Uh, people still behave shamefully towards members of the LGBTQ community. But it's a really great example of the way that increased exposure and increased um, uh, increased mutual understanding has led to a great deal of changes um, in my lifetime alone. Um, it's gone from something that is um, at best kind of icky and considered dangerous and in many places uh, legislated against to being something that, you know, with certain backslides we've seen lately, um, largely accepted on a personal level by a lot of the people in, in the country. Um, legal rights have been 
uh, achieved um, cultural representation is a lot more widespread. Um, so I think that's a really great example of the truth of what Scarlett is saying. Um, sorting out what is truly something to be afraid of from that which is unknown to us and once known might actually enrich our lives. Um, so one can hope that as we progress as a society, you know, backslides included and, and hopefully, you know, temporary, will come out the other side with some of these groups that are currently considered the frightening other with a better understanding. I see we've got a comment from Debbie. Glad you could join us, Debbie. Um, uh, I don't think Cantu, she says, I don't think Cantu is afraid for himself or his own safety, but he is, quote, afraid the violence would no longer shake me, page 112. Very true, and that ties into um, uh, the discussion we had the other day about um, moral injury also, I think. I think that's part of that moral injury idea. Um, so it's all inextricably linked. Um, it's all tied together. Uh, let's see. All right, so we have some comment here also from our friend Mickey. Um, let's see here. Okay, so Mickey says, if one is inflicting pain on another, then the overriding reaction is fear of that pain. Then I think, Mickey says, it's easy to expect that pain from any situation that is similar, and then to act to protect oneself from that pain by doing anything, by doing anything to appease the pain giver or to try to get out of the situation, okay? However, Usually the one inflicting the pain convinces the recipient that it's their actions that have been the cause of the pain. So their victimization is their own fault. So a new reality does exist for that person based in incorrect information, but real for them nonetheless. If one is convinced by another that the other is bad and we have to protect ourselves from them, um, classic fear of that other. Yeah, so the, the fear of the other is strong, even with little proof or proof that belies the original belief. Uh, fear of the known, I think she means because fear of the unknown is so strong, it takes little to evoke it. I hope I'm getting that right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's classic gaslighting, isn't it? Are you all familiar with the term gaslighting? It's sort of one of our cultural buzzwords at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, apt in many situations, but that's uh, the act of, of someone with some sort of authority in some way, whether it's uh, legal authority, um, cultural authority, social authority, um, using that power to convince others, one other or a whole group of others of a false reality, um, lying to them, trying to make them feel that they're not crazy, that they are crazy for not seeing it themselves. Um, gaslighting, it comes from a movie. Some Gaslight, I think, is the name of the movie, where a husband is doing that to his wife. It's a very classic sort of abuse technique um, where, you know, uh, you know, what do you mean you don't, uh, you don't understand that that uh, spinach is bad for you. We all know that spinach is bad for us. What are you crazy for wanting to eat spinach? Jeez, wow, what's wrong with you? So we see that happening on a personal basis. We see that happening on a societal basis. And there might not be one person standing at the top uh, declaiming these uh, falsehoods about um, the other immigrants in this case. It might just be sort of a, a pre-ingrained thread in our culture that gets repeated and built upon. Or in some cases, there's, there certainly are examples of, uh, of people in authority telling us, um, you know, they're rapists, they're thieves, they're, they're terrible, they're monsters, they're animals. Um, and we all, we all know where that comes from. Um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but that, that fear of the other is strong and it helps create a reality um, that is hard to shake, especially if you're looking for someone to blame for whatever troubles are occurring in your own life. Um, 
And we have a comment from Ed, uh, and he ties it into the fear currently centered around the coronavirus, which I think is certainly an apropos uh, comparison to draw. Um, people hoarding toilet paper, people saying you can't come into my territory if you've been exposed. Uh, you know, there's been uh, talk of Florida banning people from New York and Texas banning people from New York and are we going to be quarantined and all this stuff. Um, uh, society and government administrations can create fear of immigrants. Um, yeah, like I, like I said, quote, they're a horde of criminals, rapists, drug dealers. Immigrants will take our jobs, take food and money through our social service programs, etc. cetera. Um, so if we, it's all part of that gaslighting that, that's, that is affecting so many, so many layers of our society. Um, Claudia has chimed in in the comments here. When I think of fear leading to distrust, it makes me think about whites who roll up their windows and they drive through an African-American neighborhood or the period in our history when individuals ostracized Chinese Americans as the quote, yellow peril and feared them and mistrusted them. We are afraid of each other when we don't get to know each other or we isolate ourselves from each other. We are afraid of anything or anyone who is different. Currently, Muslim Americans are treated with fear and distrust. I think that changes when we get to know each other and find out that we are more alike than different. Absolutely. Um, and we keep learning it over and over again, but there, we always seem to find a new, a new other to fear and hate. Um, that's all I've got for comments from the planning committee. If anybody else has thoughts on the theme of fear in the book leading up to the conclusion of part two, feel free to chime in. I'll read again uh, Claudia's initial um, thematic uh, discussion topic. Part two ends with a discussion of fear as we have been discussing for the past 17 minutes. Quoting poet and essayist Cristina Rivera Garza, Cantu writes, fear isolates, fear teaches us to distrust. He concludes that this fear, quote, makes us individually and as a society crazy, isolated, filled with distrust for our fellow human beings, the people who share our neighborhoods, our cities, our country, our borders, our intractably and intimately interwoven global community the people with whom we share our very lives. David has chimed in, fear of the border patrol agents is not evident in the book. Interesting comment. And again, um, my semi-regular caveat that I have not read the book uh, comes into play again. So if anybody uh, cares to respond to that, um, feel free. Um, I do know that since this is a book from the point of view of one who is of the border patrol or who has been of the border patrol, um, it would make sense to me that uh, that, that, is, um, that perspective is not going to be as clearly developed uh, as it might be in a book from the point of view of, of, a, of a migrant, of an immigrant, someone trying to cross the border and running into the border patrol. Um, but that is interesting. Um, and as in so many cases, when it comes to uh, uh, these hot button topics of the day, uh, we benefit from reading widely, multiply, um, you know, <laughs> uh, don't just read one book on this topic, but find a book that addresses it from all kinds of different angles and not just pro-immigration and anti-immigration, um, but uh, from the perspective of the border agents like we've got here in this book, from the perspective of the migrant, from the perspective of the coyote, uh, from the perspective of the Mexican who is not traveling across the border. Are there any, um, uh, you know, academic works from Mexican scholars or from Mexican journalists or things of that nature? Um, and yeah, at all, everything in between. Um, cast cast as wide a net as you feel comfortable casting to under, to get your, your fingers around this topic. Um, I'm struck reading, rereading that line from page 158 that Claudia included about the 
uh, intimate interwoven global community. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever read an author named uh, David Mitchell. Uh, he's one of my favorite writers, although what I'm about to see, what I'm about to say is uh, <laughs> drawn less from one of his books than a movie based on his book. But uh, he wrote a book called Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas was made into a movie starring Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, lots of cool people. Um, and that's the theme of a lot of Mitchell's work, but especially Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas is a narrative. You, you read it, you're like, what is this? What am I reading? It's It jumps from um, a guy on a, on a ship crossing the ocean in the 1700s to a journalist in the 1970s trying to chase down uh, you know, a scandal to uh, a guy in a far future post-apocalyptic setting and dealing with, with all that. Um, and you gradually do come to realize what ties these people together, but um, there's a track on the, on the soundtrack of the movie called All Borders Are Convention. Um, all the divisions we set up between ourselves are just things that we have collectively decided to be so. And we get so tied up in defending that border and saying, you're on that side of the border and we're on this side of the border. And we've got, we've, you know, maybe there are ways for us to come across one way or the other, but we've, you know, it's gotta be complicated and it's gotta be nearly impossible and it's gotta be uh, traumatic. Um, and the truth is that it doesn't have to be any of those things. Um, it's all just something we've agreed upon uh, and we could agree upon something different. It doesn't have to be what I think should be and it doesn't have to be what you think it should be, but we could agree for it to be something different. And I think, I feel like that's where a lot of the, the debate bogs down um, because some people see it as immutable and eternal and that's the way it is. And you have to start from the way it is before you can even start to talk about changing things. Well, you don't have to. That's my little soapbox, but uh, read David Mitchell, Cloud Atlas, listen to the soundtrack. It's really good. I see we had a couple of comments while I was on my soapbox. Claudia, thank you. Uh, point of view is everything. Absolutely. Um, all right. And Mickey responding to David's comment, he does talk about the fact that his mother is afraid of the agents and what they do and for his work that it will change him. So yeah, there's, it might not be as focused on the fear of the border patrol agents as another work might be, but it looks like there are some indications in there um, about the way some folks must feel about that situation. Um, okay, keep commenting. As always, the video stays for you to comment upon at will after we go offline here. Um, that closes up the discussion of part two of the book. And like I said, Claudia's already sent us um, a list of themes for part three, and that will take us through uh, this week to the end of next week. Um, Yep. Yeah, Mickey. Uh, we can talk about the next topics, including that I sent those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the next topics that Mickey sent out to the group that's on our little mailing list are for uh, next, the next topics for Wednesday and Friday and, and, and thereafter. And I'll post those here on Facebook too, the way I did with these, uh, this first batch. And, um, and yeah, we're having fun. I hope you guys are enjoying the conversation. It's really important. It was great to see how many people commented on the last video and it's great to see that we got some commenters here today really appreciate it i know we've got something go gonna hopefully appear in the paper this wednesday so maybe we'll pick up um, either some of the folks we had lost in the transition from the in-person meetings to these digital meetings and maybe we'll pick up some brand new people who had not uh, had not been involved except for maybe they bought the book so hope to hear from all kinds of folks over the next uh, next few days. So oh, Debbie, don't worry about it, Debbie. Type at your own pace. It's all good. Get them, get them, the, the video stays so you can comment. Um, all right, I am going to sign off now because I've gone way long on the last two and right now we're over 20 minutes. So um, have a good day, you guys. Happy Monday. Hope to see you on Wednesday. All right, take care.
Thanks, everybody.